Did you know that in Night of Champions 2008, a current WWE headliner and bona fide megastar technically defeated himself and was beaten by himself, walking into the pay-per-view with a championship and leaving with that same championship, despite kind of losing? Well, that factoid and many, many more prove that there is plenty of lore when it comes to this pay-per-view, or premium live event, I guess. It is 2023. I'm Andy from What Culture, and here are 10 things you didn't know about WWE Night of Champions. Number 10, the conundrum of Cody Rhodes. So yes, Cody was the megastar I was referring to in the introduction there, because if you go up and look at Wikipedia or Cage Match or whatever you get your results from, and you go down to roughly the middle of the Night of Champions 2008 card, you'll, you'll see something curious. It'll tell you that in a WWE Tag Team Championship match, a team consisting of Ted DiBiase Jr. and Cody Rhodes defeated Hardcore Holly and Cody Rhodes in a sort of halfway title change. And for those of you who weren't exactly avid WWE viewers at the time, the younger viewers out there, I imagine, you might look at this match and go, what, what the hell happened here? But it's actually quite simple to explain. Ted DiBiase Jr. coming into the pay-per-view promised a mystery partner alongside whom he would go after Hardcore Holly and Cody Rhodes, who were the tag team champions at the time. That mystery partner turned out to be Cody. So even though it technically happened within the confines of the same match, with Cody jumping from one team to another, he technically ended his own reign to start a brand new reign, with Ted turning on his devious mentor Bob Holly, who was a bit of a prick to him throughout their run. It also kind of sowed the seeds for legacy later down the line as well, making this quite the conundrum indeed. Number 9. Double Duty Duo Not counting Cody Rhodes in this one because because the whole kerfuffle I've just described technically happened in one match, but there have actually only been two wrestlers in WWE history who have ever pulled double duty wrestling twice on the same night at Night of Champions. One of them is Seth Rollins, and one of them is Curtis Axel. Axel had what was probably the best night of his main roster run in 2013. First of all, he defended his Intercontinental Championship against Kofi Kingston, and then later on, he, he technically beat CM Punk, albeit in a handicap match where Paul Heyman was his partner and Ryback interfered and he didn't score the pin or whatever. But still, technically, a win over CM Punk after a successful IC title defense that's a pretty good night. And then two years later, Seth Rollins did it a bit more prestigiously. He did start with a defeat when he lost the United States Championship to John Cena, but since when is losing to John Cena any kind of great shame? Then later on in the main event of the evening, he faced Sting in what would be Sting's final WWE match ever, which wasn't exactly any kind of in-ring classic, but still, it's a nice little thing to have on your resume. Retired Sting until he showed back up in AEW a few years later. Later. Obviously, that's the in-character side of it. I got this scalp, blah, 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 I beat Sting. Sting was very seriously injured in this match to the extent that he never, well, we thought he was never gonna work again. That meant when he did show up all those years later at Winter Is Coming, it was pretty damn mind-blowing. But still, Seth got the better of him at Night of Champions 2015. Number eight, secondary title supremacy. WWE haven't always given their secondary championships the most importance over the past couple of decades, but interestingly, they kind of have at Night of Champions because during the pay-per-view's initial run from 2008 to 2015, you knew every single year you were getting an Intercontinental title match, a US title match, and a tag team title match. And yes, this is technically part of the Night of Champions gimmicks, the whole every belt must be defended deal that they try to go with this show, but don't always enforce. But at the same time, it was probably quite nice for those secondary champions who weren't by any means guaranteed to get on other pay-per-views, but when this one rolled around, they could get that nice little payday for sure. Number seven, 2023 will break an illustrious streak. So unless something major happens between now and the show airing, and I don't know if it will, Roman Reigns isn't actually defending his undisputed WWE Universal, whatever that belt's gonna be called going forward. He's not defending it at Night of Champions 2023. Instead, it's gonna be him and Solo Sokoa against Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens for those tag team titles. Another twist in the on going bloodline saga as Roman and Solo try to outdo the Usos. The interesting thing about this is that the WWE Championship has been on the line on every other Night of Champions pay-per-view that has ever happened. 
Not here. The streak comes to an end. Roman Reigns will celebrate 1,000 days on top of WWE on the night, but the gold will not be on the line. Which of course clears the runway for the brand new World Heavyweight Championship, which will be contested when AJ Styles and Seth Rollins face off, probably in the main event. Number six, eight in a row, and then an eight year gap. This is more of a cute piece of happenstance rather than something that WWE sat down and tried to manufacture, trying to weave into the lore of this show as a whole. But the original run of Night of Champions in this company took place from 2008 until 2015, that's eight different incarnations before it was kind of done away with and Clash of Champions came back in 2016. And quite conveniently, quite coincidentally, probably, uh, the gap between that last show in 2015 and 2023 is the exact same. Now the show is back, we had the eight year run, now we've had the eight year gap, wonder if we'll get another eight and then it'll go away for eight more. Who the heck knows? It, it's just kind of interesting, okay? Leave me alone. Number five, the only non-WWE title to ever be defended is the ECW World Championship. Now, of course, this was technically under WWE's umbrella. It was WWE ECW, as it was derivatively called back in the day. But that championship doesn't have the WWE prefix. It was a continuation of the old ECW title. So in my warped view, it counts. In 2008, the ECW world title was on the line as Mark Henry won it in a match featuring Kane and The Big Show, which was kind of like a trial run to see how Mark would do as a top world champion in WWE with what was technically the third biggest world title in the company at the time. Then the following year, it was defended by Christian against an ECW original in Tommy Dreamer, keeping the ECW title's presence alive. And after that, like the brand, it kind of went away. Number four, a perfect 10. Quick costume change for this one, but you don't need to worry about that. Anyway, did you know that up until this year's event at Night of Champions, a total of 10 different titles have been on the line at this event? Well, if you didn't, you certainly do now. And we've got the usual mix of stuff in here, your two top level world championships in WWE, the WWE and World Heavyweight titles. You've got the old woman's title, you've got the Divas title, the Intercontinental, the United States. We've got two separate versions of the tag team championships. We've got the ECW title, as we've just mentioned, and number 10, the Cruiserweight Championship, which was on the 2007 Vengeance version of Night of Champions before it was discontinued later that year, hence why it wasn't on any other shows. So a perfect 10 titles defended on Night of Champions, but guess what? It's all gonna change this coming Saturday because for the very first time, we're gonna add the Raw Women's title to the lineup. We're gonna add the SmackDown Women's title to the lineup as well. And these things, of course, did not exist when the show was originally going around. I suppose technically as well, you've also got the undisputed tag team championships, although the lineage of that is a little complicated. And it's the same for the World Heavyweight title. So I guess it depends how generous you're gonna be. If you're feeling super generous coming out of this weekend, 14 different titles defended across the history of this show. If you're feeling a little bit less generous, we're down to 12. Either way, perfect 10, not so perfect anymore, huh? Number three, the ripple effect of 2011. If the summer of punk hadn't already come screeching to a halt by the time we reached this pay-per-view, then it definitely did here, as Triple H heinously defeated CM Punk at Night of Champions 2011. It's something that Punk never let go of, as he admitted during his incendiary appearance on the Art of Wrestling podcast after leaving WWE in 2014. Punk outlined just how angry the whole situation made him and went into detail about how WrestleMania 30 was eventually supposed to be some kind of make good where he'd tangle up with Triple H, but he knew better and he wanted better for himself and that rematch didn't end up happening. In 2011, CM Punk had to wait all the way until November to get that definitive WWE Championship win, but he had never looked lower after coming from so high than when his shoulders were being pinned to the match by WWE's kayfabe COO. Number two, why it's called Night of Champions. At one stage in his run, Vince McMahon was incredibly reluctant to make the most of WCW's legacy and fully utilize properties and pay-per-views and matches and everything else that had been established in Ted Turner's promotion. He was kind of allergic to it, in fact. The most cited example of this would be War Games, which Triple H was already very 
very keen on bringing on in 2002, but when he presented it to his dopey father-in-law, the end result was Elimination Chamber, which always felt like something of a compromise. And perhaps this is why WWE felt they could never fully commit to the old TBS staple Clash of the Champions either. They kind of flirted with it with Vengeance 2007, which was subtitled Night of Champions, but instead of going with Clash of the Champions, which would be the closest WCW equivalent, Night of Champions became the pay-per-view thereafter from 2008 onwards until we got to 2016 when W did kind of go for Clash but still had to put their little spin on it. Clash of the Champions? No. Clash of Champions? Yes. Vince McMahon used to be obsessed with this kind of stuff. He had to stamp his own identity on things that clearly came from another promotion. That being said, on the 26th of March 2001, maybe he was a little too preoccupied to focus on these kind of subtleties. And at number one, WCW did it first. Perhaps to avoid confusion with the old Clash of the Champions label, WCW absolutely loaded the final episode ever of Nitro on the 26th of March 2001, subtitling it Night of Champions for a big blockbuster blow off before Vince McMahon eventually swept in and bought the whole damn company in probably the worst day in American wrestling history. Honest. And on this Night of Champions special, every major WCW championship was up for grabs. We got the final Cruiserweight Tag Team Championship match. We got Shane Helms successfully defending his Cruiserweight Championship so that he could carry that into life as a newly minted WWE star. And of course, in the main event, we got Booker T emerging as a unified WCW United States and World Heavyweight Champion becoming the centerpiece of the eventual invasion. This ultimately wasn't enough to convince USA Network officials that a WCW product would be viable on television after the WWE takeover, but it was still a fun night for a bunch of wrestlers who were probably quite frustrated by the way they'd been used during the last few years of WCW, which... I mean, you know what happened there. So, Night of Champions became a subtitle for WCW Nitro in 2001. In 2007, it became a subtitle for WWE Vengeance. In 2008, it became its own pay-per-view. In 2015, it kind of went away again. And now we're here in 2023, and it's back. And that's it, our list of fun facts and everything else regarding WWE Night of Champions, which of course returns this weekend, Saturday night, it's gonna be a show. That's what I'll say about that one. Uh, thank you for joining. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing and all that good stuff. And if you've got any more interesting bits and bobs that we might have missed, let us know down in the comment section below. After that, you can follow me on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE. That's not right. You can follow us on Twitter at that tag. Then you can find me at Andy H. Murray if you want to. Although after that error, you probably don't. So I'll see you later. Bye.